Happy New Year, motherfuckers. It's time for the end of the year special for 2015. I don't have a lot to say about the year in general, so let's just get this shit over with. Two years ago, I wasted 80 bucks on this lazy compilation release. And the world just fucking watched. Same shit, different series. 2015 brought us another lame Bethesda ploy to make money by exploiting the collector mentality and nostalgia. The Fallout Anthology. The Fallout Anthology release is just about as weak as The Elder Scrolls 1. What you get is a minimalist collection in low quality packaging. The only good thing about the compilation is the price point. This is a good way to get a lot of Fallout games for not a lot of money. The physical packaging is almost an afterthought. If you really want the hard copies, this may be the only way to get a physical disc release of, say, Fallout Tactics, which is very rare. The problem is the discs don't work without Steam. The bomb-shaped case is kind of cool, but it is way too big, and the internals are very low quality. The thing kind of falls apart under its own weight. Overall, this just seems like a miserly way to exploit the collector's mentality that's kind of running rampant right now. Now that Bethesda owns Doom, we're probably going to see another cheap-ass compilation release for that series. And I'll probably buy it again, because I never fucking learn. Hotline Miami 2, wrong number. Hotline Miami was just the best fucking game, so Hotline Miami 2 earned my pre-order. I even got the version with the soundtrack on vinyl, even though I do not and never will own a turntable. Hotline Miami 2 has some terrible gameplay and some great gameplay. It's much harder than the first game, and some levels have arbitrary bullshit puzzles that require impeccable timing or just a lot of luck. Some of these sections are way too hard and obliterate the flow of the game. The good stuff in Wrong Number is buried in a bizarre, complicated story that tries too hard to turn what happened in the first game into something epic. The story is still interesting, but it's so far up its own ass that I don't feel welcome. Like, the game wants me to get out of its ass so it can have time to itself. The gameplay diversity in Hotline Miami 1 was the masks that changed your character's innate abilities. This is kind of missing from Wrong Number because there are a bunch of characters with only a few masks each. This means you can't replay the game and try different masks on different levels because you're restricted to the character playing on that level. Hotline Miami 2 is a bit of a letdown after the first game, but it's still fucking fun with beautiful graphics and excellent music. This shit is seriously banging. Nuclear Throne. This one barely made it out this year, but thanks to early access, I feel like I've pretty much played all of it already. Nuclear Throne is a pretty standard roguelike, but the execution is excellent and the game has a vibrant personality. Imagine Binding of Isaac meets Broforce. My only complaint with the game is that when you sit on the titular Nuclear Throne, you get a crown upgrade, which is useless. Every super special, super secret crown upgrade has negative effects so severe they sort of outweigh the positive ones. None of the buffs are so game-changing or interesting that they're worth the crippling debuffs. It's such a small part of the game that I wouldn't care, except the game is thematically all about these crowns, so they should have tried harder to make them fun. The roguelike style also isn't entirely for me. Like with Binding of Isaac, FTL, and Teleglitch, the sheer randomness of enemies and item pickups means that a good playthrough requires a lot of luck. I always find these games hard to play through, because I get frustrated with the bad luck playthroughs that go nowhere, and I'm bored of the game before I can finish it. I don't really mind not being able to save your game, but I would like it if they just made the games a bit easier. I'd like to be able to experience the entire game without having to invest a hundred hours basically trying to farm the right sequence of random drops. If I got this video out in time, you can pick up a boxed copy through IndieBox right now. Which I'd recommend. The game's good. The best early access game that actually came out this year... Broforce. Wait, this came out this year? Huh. Early Access makes it hard to keep track of all this shit. I played all of the Broforce Early Access content and loved it, but I was expecting the usual letdown when Early Access games finally come out. It turns out the Early Access content was only like a quarter of the game, and now that it's out for real, there's way more stuff to do. I don't want to spoil the good stuff, but I'll say there are way more bros than before, and way more levels. The campaign mode even has a total overhaul, with special side missions to unlock sweet weapon drops. Broforce might be the best spiritual successor to Metal Slug you'll ever get, and I recommend you give it a whirl. The game I felt obligated to buy, WWE 2K15. I swore up and down that if this came out on PC, I would buy it. Well, it did come out on PC, half a year late, 
and it showed up on sale for half price, so I pretty much had to put my money where my mouth is. Before this, the most recent wrestling game I've played was WWF No Mercy on the N64, which is still widely considered to be the best wrestling game ever made. WWE 2K15 isn't going to change that, but it's pretty enjoyable. The career mode in WWE 2K15 skirts the line of kayfabe. What I really want is a wrestling game that plays more like Guitar Hero. You'd have improv bits in the middle where you try to put in some back and forth, and then scripted sequences you have to pull off as precisely and awesomely as possible. WWE 2K15 has you gain Twitter followers by putting on good matches, but it keeps it kayfabe. I want them to go a little farther. Your performance in matches should increase your following, and then you're given some victories. Over time, you would gain some level of creative control and participate in the booking. The way it is in WWE 2K15, the perfect career is one in which you never lose. If you're a boxer or an MMA fighter, that would be perfect, but in wrestling, that's boring. If you start to win too much, the crowd should turn on you and chant Goldberg until you take a dive. There should be no way squashing an opponent in 30 seconds results in a match rating of 5 stars, instant classic! The game overall plays pretty well, and the reversal system isn't awful. The physics and moves are occasionally a little janky, but the game is fun. The grapple system hasn't really innovated since No Mercy, and the chain wrestling is pretty much tacked on, but it all works. The Nintendo needs money, let's crank out a... fuck, I forget how this goes. Majora's Mask 3D. This game has some actual improvements over the N64 version, and it's pretty good, but I just can't play handheld games. I don't sit around in public that much, and I can't afford to take a vacation. When am I supposed to play this? Just like, on the couch? While watching Netflix? I can't fit this thing into my life and it bothers me because I love the device, just like I loved the PSP, but I can't make it happen. Multiplayer Game of the Year, Battlefield Hardline. If you played Battlefield 4, you probably hated Hardline. That's the impression I got from the internet. I skipped Battlefield 4, so I was in the mood for some Battlefield again, and Hardline did the job. There seems to be less and less environmental destruction in each subsequent Battlefield game, which is strange because that's the whole appeal of the games and the Frostbite engine. Hardline also boasts no improvements over Battlefield 3. They're not doing much with the cops and robbers thing, there's way less content, smaller maps, and almost no vehicle gameplay. However, when I got it at release, it actually had active players, which is the only real draw of these games that iterate every year. I reinstalled it to grab some footage for this review, all 50 gigabytes of it, and it's already gone down the tubes like most multiplayer games do. Almost all of the servers have moved on to the paid downloadable content, so I'd need to buy a few expansions or buy premium mode to really get back into the game. I was only able to find one North American server with people in it and had a few good matches. I really started getting into it again because, man, I freaking love Battlefield. If you play multiplayer shooters, I guess you have to be a Call of Duty guy or a Battlefield guy, and I'm a Battlefield guy. I'm not sure why I'm willing to give Hardline a pass when normally games that are actually worse than their predecessor bother me so much. Hmm. The Examined Life of Gaming Game of the Year is Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. Hell, this would be the game of the century if I hadn't played it a thousand times already in the last ten years. Metal Gear Solid V is really fucking great, which I guess is surprising. I've played the Metal Gear Solid games almost religiously, but I couldn't recommend them to anyone. Metal Gear Solid has been a dog shit series since day one. If you're into the story, I'm sure you can enjoy the wild and crazy ride, but no, no, the story is something you accidentally get Stockholmed into enjoying while you try to play the fun game buried underneath. Metal Gear Solid always has really awesome gameplay with a shed load of fascinating little details. The only problem is that the gameplay is doled out in Cheerio-sized increments between stretches of cinematics that are fucking interminable and boss fights that are fucking arbitrary. Metal Gear Solid V actually steps back and lets you enjoy the gameplay. And it's pretty fucking great, which is surprising. Why is this all so surprising? The only thing wrong with Metal Gear Solid V is that it's the same game as every other game. Metal Gear Solid V opens with just the worst intro mission in a hospital with lots of story and almost no gameplay. All the typical Metal Gear bullshit shows up. Lots of meat shield soldiers ineffectually spraying lead at supervillains with elemental powers while your character watches with a stupid expression on his face, what have you. It improves really fast after that. Kiefer Sutherland is a phenomenal replacement for David Hayter. I know this happened in Ground Zeroes, but that game was a false start, so I'm skipping it. David Hayter's snake was always comedic, purposefully or not. I don't know if it was his snake voice or the script, but David Hayter's snakes were always idiots. 
The game tells you over and over that he's a literal genius and a charismatic, natural-born leader, but he comes off as a fucking idiot loser. When David Hayter says, Hmm, Metal Gear? He sounds like a senile jackass who totally forgot what Metal Gear was, even though it's his life's mission to destroy them in every game. When Kiefer Sutherland says, Hmm, Metal Gear. It's because he knows exactly what he's up against, and he's ready for anything. I heard something about people being mad about a lame plot twist, but I didn't really mind. Without some kind of plot twist, Phantom Pain would just be filler. The whole series was a foregone conclusion when Guns of the Patriots came out. Plot is still just the worst kind of nonsense, but the focus is finally on gameplay. For once. For once, a 30-hour game isn't 27 hours of cutscene. Anyway, you've probably heard this already, but abducting people and animals and tanks and stuff with the Fulton Balloon is addictively fun. I play this game so much, I get really excited to see a shipping container full of materials for the war effort behind the department store. Metal Gear Solid V combines the cool recruiting and researching mechanic of portable ops with the actually functional third-person gameplay of Metal Gear Solid 4. The worst parts of Metal Gear Solid 4 were the really awful boss fights copied verbatim from Metal Gear Solid 3 and the stupidly boring third and fifth acts. Phantom Pain doesn't have that problem. The weapons customization stuff is a lot of fun too. Ever wanted to put a Dragunov barrel on an AR-10? Because I didn't before, but I really want to now. It's a bummer that there are no real-world weapons. They're all kind of vague approximations or hybrids of other things. The AK-76, or whatever it's called, can be configured as a rifle or a shorty carbine or an RPK, and can have the caliber swapped to make it an AK-47 or an AK-74. The small details are wrong, and the gun isn't a real gun, which just isn't how Metal Gear Solid usually works, but I guess I don't mind it just this once. Yet anyway, the series is probably dead. Hopefully dead. Just let it die. Kojima's out to pasture, guys. Just move on to something else. I don't have as much to say about Metal Gear Solid V, the examined life of gaming game of the year, as I do about Fallout 4, a game that makes me apoplectic with nerd rage. At the end of the day, or the year as the case may be, Metal Gear Solid V lets you ride into an enemy base on a Blackhawk, firing grenades and the minigun out the door, then hot drop with your mini mech and wreck up the place while the helicopter circles around, strafing fuckers with rebel yell blaring from the loudspeaker. Shit. The I paid $120 for this award goes to GTA V. Well, finally the real version of the game comes out, and what the motherfuck is different about it? First-person mode? A clunky, screwed-up first-person mode? Woo fucking who? I'm so glad I bought this game twice and waited like two years to finally play this version. There are still no fucking heists. It took them more than 500 days after the release of the game to finally deliver on the promise of heist content in multiplayer. And guess the fuck what? They're just more boring scripted missions, exactly like they were in single-player. How in the hell is all of the content in Grand Theft Fucking Auto, the most famously freeform game series, so linear and constricted? The multiplayer mode is still a load of garbage. GTA 4's multiplayer was a very organic experience with feuds between players growing and exploding all over the map. People running from the cops, screwing around with jumps and choppers, and parachutes in Ballad of Gay Tony. GTA 5 adds too much structure and too much persistence with tracking your money and buying guns and cars that it ruins itself. You can't goof off and have fun like in GTA 4 because if you kill a guy, even if he's trying to kill you, you have to pay his fucking health insurance and pay for his fucking car and then you get branded as a bad player. Is this supposed to be Second Life? God, I hate this. What the multiplayer mode really is, is PlayStation Home. It's just a hub world for the actual mission content, which is so boring. If they just could have made the mission content part of the actual persistent world, GTA V would be the best game ever made. But they didn't, and it's not. GTA V has great music, and I enjoy just being in the world, but that's not enough. The experience of inhabiting a beautiful world was much better in Red Dead Redemption, because the feel of the game was more conducive to wandering around, hunting animals, and enjoying the scenery. Just like with Red Dead, the combat is mediocre with a stupidly cluttered weapons menu and piss-easy auto-aim pop-tarting. They're not even using the great physics engine to full effect like they did in GTA 4. This game is 100% worse than GTA 4. The award for Most Disappointing Game of the Year, also known as the Max Payne 3 Award or the Rockstar Games Award for Pretentious Bullshit, Fallout 4. The box of Fallout 4 reminds you you're special, because otherwise you wouldn't know this is a goddamn RPG. 
With Skyrim, Bethesda tried to make an RPG with no attributes, and with Fallout 4, they've made an RPG with no skills, which makes this the pointless yin to Skyrim's paradoxical yang. Fallout 4 and Skyrim don't stand out from the pack like Bethesda games used to. They have become very streamlined, but can't even muster up any memorable moments like a Call of Duty or Battlefield game can. Would it surprise you to learn New Vegas is my favorite Fallout game? Maybe not, I've probably said that before. New Vegas was like a dodecahedron, a little rough around the edges, sure, but that's forgivable when there are so many edges. Fallout 4 and Skyrim round off the edges, which sucks because you can't play a role-playing game with a fucking marble. If they'd succeeded in making Fallout 4 the total fantasy of a highly polished Bethesda game, that would at least be something, but the game is still a V8 firing on no cylinders. They're aping every other open-world non-tent generator, but without the polish. Fallout 4 has much less everything than New Vegas, and for me at least, it's hard to step back from all that freedom and depth, and that level of involvement in the plot. Fallout 4 has nothing to offer. Nothing. It is a game sold entirely on gimmicks. Bethesda keeps trying to tell an emotional, personal story with their Fallout games. Obviously, New Vegas did it right. Your character was purposefully a blank slate with no fixed background, and there was only about five minutes of linear intro before the game opened up to you. In Fallout 4, you play a more developed character with a very personal motivation to your quest. The problem is, it doesn't fucking work. The character interaction is still so stilted and awkward, just like every Bethesda game since Morrowind, that there is no way in hell you'll feel any emotional investment from this unoriginal schlock. Oh, your spouse was killed and your child kidnapped? Fucking seriously, Bethesda? Is this the first story you ever wrote? You expect me to feel genuine emotion over the kidnapping of the least convincing fake baby since American fucking Sniper? They're trying for so much more range of delivery from their voice actors, and they do a pretty good job. Too bad character movement and blocking is still so fake I can't take it seriously when they try for high drama. The writing is also spastic. The tone changes wildly from sarcastic to maudlin between sentences. This isn't a war, it's a murder. This isn't a war, it's a moita. In New Vegas, you could get involved in conversations with people because you could talk about every topic. Conversations in Fallout 4 run through once and you pick one of four options at certain points, like Mass Effect. Pick the left option to be a sarcastic bitch. The right option to be a douche nozzle. The top option to metal gear your way through every conversation. And the bottom option to be an actually somewhat competent protagonist and decent human being. There's a typical RPG thing in Fallout and earlier Elder Scrolls games where you exhaust conversation options with each character. You go through every conversation asking questions about everything so you can learn something or find a new quest. It's not something you have to do, it's something the games make you want to do. To properly play Fallout 4, you have to pick one of the four dialogue directions and stick to it. Seriously. If you're that curious about the plot, pick the top option every time. There's nothing of value to learn, but it might satisfy your curiosity. If you want to actually enjoy the game, pick the left option and just enjoy the sarcasm, or the bottom option to just keep things rolling. Bethesda realized they can sell a game on the promise of a few new gimmicks instead of actually making a new game. Let's take stock of the gimmicks. Number one, settlement management. Number two, equipment customization. Number three, jetpack. I'm going to address all this shit. I was hoping the game would finally revitalize the game engine, which hasn't changed in any significant way since Oblivion. For just a minute at the start of the game, I thought they had. Well, the game still has the same chunky controls and clumsy movement physics, but you go to the first town and you can go inside all of the buildings. They're not little pocket dimensions that you teleport into and out of. They're actual physical spaces. This is incredible. How did they get this crappy old engine to do this? And then you get into the second town and you can't go inside any of the buildings, and then you realize how they got the crappy old engine to do it. Nine and a half out of ten buildings in the game are inaccessible. Man, I wonder where my objective in this town is. Could it be in the only building that isn't boarded up and inaccessible? Almost every large location is still a pocket dimension with a door-shaped teleporter to get in and out of. Some locations do have buildings you can go into without transitioning to a new map, but far fewer than you'd expect. All of Bethesda's new additions to the Fallout universe are cartoonish and lame. The new good guy faction is the Minutemen, a depressingly boring yet silly collection of foppish idiots in tri-corner hats with laser muskets. Laser. Muskets. Ugh. The new bad guy faction is the Institute, whose existence is antithetical to everything Fallout is about. It's basically a continuation of the Enclave. New Vegas told a huge story about the struggle between the NCR, Caesar's Legion, and the free people of the Wasteland. Fallout 4 is about Revolutionary War G.I. Joe and the robot version of the Enclave. 
I think I figured it out, though. Fallout is a very, very West Coast series. Bethesda is a very, very, very East Coast developer. They just keep trying to fit their square East Coast peg into Fallout's round West Coast hole. Giggity. Bethesda is stuck on the history of New England. Nobody cares. This is a game about the motherfucking nuclear apocalypse. The landscape of the pre-apocalyptic world is completely irrelevant. The series is about what people do after. Get your archaic New England bullshit out of my Fallout games. The new settlement system feels tacked on, like a really high quality mod, but still a mod. It's pointless, and it doesn't even function. I have settlers coming up to me and saying that even though there are 35 beds for a settlement of 18, people are complaining about the bed situation, and people are having to sleep in shifts. At night, they stand around in the middle of town like children of the corn. If you set up a food and drink store, they'll congregate around that, but the problem is everybody works the same shifts, so the place isn't even open at night. They're meeting for drinks at a bar that is closed. I also set up my settlements with an overlapping phalanx of turrets covering every angle, but I'm not sure why I bother. Every few minutes you'll have to rescue a kidnapped settler or run off some ghouls or raiders or mutants threatening your settlement. Oh, are you being threatened by ghouls? I mean, shit, I equipped every last goddamn one of you with a full suit of combat armor, and every approach to your camp is covered by heavy machine gun and rocket turrets, but sure, I'll go sweep the ghouls out of some random cave for you. I once had three settlers get kidnapped from my main settlement back to back to back. After the first one was kidnapped, I cleared out the raider camp and rescued them. The next two were kidnapped to the same location, but... Because the raiders hadn't respawned, there was nobody there guarding them. They kidnapped themselves and held themselves for fucking ransom. Once I realized how fucking bogus the randomly generated content was, every time a settler got kidnapped, I'd just hand over a bucket of caps to the settlers and tell them to pay the ransom. Every single time they expressed doubt that paying the ransom is a good idea. And yes, if the game gave even half a fuck, that would be true. But no, there are no consequences. Which is more valuable to you, in-game currency that you basically can't spend on anything because the crafting system has made traders obsolete, or your time? Fallout 4 is an ocean of randomly generated non-tent. None of it feels purposeful anymore. I don't want the game to keep generating useless side quests. I don't want to have to spend all of my time between adventures fighting off the same roving band of ghouls to help out a settlement. Seriously, I've killed a thousand mercenary raiders. Where do they come from and why do they keep moving back into the murder capital of the wasteland? Power armor is treated like a vehicle now instead of just a better type of armor. It's cool to get in and out, but you can basically just stay in. Power armor requires power cores to work, but they're not that hard to come by, so you might as well not require them. You also don't have to get out and put in the new fusion core manually. Either make the power armor something special that you use sparingly, or just let me wear it all the time like normal armor. This is the most non-committal game mechanic since Splinter Cell Conviction. The power armor HUD is cool, and wearing it makes you feel like a mech, but it doesn't really change gameplay that much. You can still sprint, jump, and turn on a dime. You can still sneak around. Hell, you can even sneak while jetpack jumping. There's also no build-up to get power armor. The first story mission rolls around, you get a really good suit of power armor, and you get to keep it forever. There's no need to scrounge together your suit over time, and never any reason to use improvised raider armor. Even a fully customized suit of high-end combat armor is next to worthless, so you just keep the suit on forever. The power armor jetpack gimmick also underdelivers. It consumes additional power cores to use, but it's limited by action points. That means no matter how much jetpack fuel you have, you can only make the same short jump every time. Any thoughts about flying around delivering death from above are out the window. All it does is let you get upstairs faster. Fallout 4 greatly expands on the weapons customization from New Vegas. In New Vegas, most guns had a few modifications that could be purchased and installed to improve them in small ways. It was relatively minor stuff, like extended magazines or an improved rate of fire. Fallout 4 breaks weapons customization down to the component level, and most of the weapons you encounter are improvised zip guns instead of pre-war tech. The new mechanic has just the right amount of depth, and it's fun to tinker with your guns to fit them to different roles. Your starting point is three basic receiver styles, revolver, bolt action, and auto-loading, that can be configured with barrels of various lengths, muzzle devices, magazines, optics, and stocks, or lack thereof. The base receiver can also be modified to improve damage or allow for automatic fire. One great feature is that any pistol can be converted to a rifle by slapping a stock on it, or vice versa, and you can make all sorts of franken-guns. 
The crafting is the core of the game, but it's actually kind of limited. There's nowhere near as much crafting as in New Vegas or variety in weapons. As an example, Fallout 4 features one side-by-side -side shotgun and one semi-automatic combat shotgun. New Vegas, by comparison, had numerous shotguns of several action types in both 12 and 20 gauge chamberings. New Vegas also continued the fine Fallout tradition of having multiple types of ammunition for each caliber, making the distinction between ball, hollow point, and armor-piercing ammo. You could even acquire the skills to handload your own ammo for improved accuracy and power, and a selection of shot, slug, beanbag, and dragon's breath shells for the shotguns made them the ultimate utility weapon. Your mileage may vary, but it's difficult for me to walk away from all that depth. Fallout 4's pipe-based weapons are a cool throwback to Fallout 2, and they have a cool, scrap-made aesthetic to them. The design of the pre-war guns is pretty pathetic, though. They have an overwrought Art Deco style to them, which is silly. In what insane alternate history would an infantryman ever carry an assault rifle with a water-cooling jacket around the barrel that is incapable of automatic fire? The 10mm pistol has also put on more and more weight with every Fallout game, and now looks like it was carved from a cinder block. The changes to the gunplay make it clear that Bethesda is trying to make this play like a shooter. This isn't automatically a bad thing, but the game engine is fucking ancient at this point, so it's not like you're playing a real shooter. Hit detection is just plain bad, so you'll hit the empty space between bars on a railing, or you'll hit a piece of cover even though you're clearly shooting over it, because the level geometry hitboxes are bigger than what you see. The bigger problem is that there are certain things you expect from a fast-paced FPS game. When I put a 50 BMG round into the base of a raider's unarmored skull from 30 paces, I expect them to be done in one. If this is an RPG, I'm willing to fudge the details a bit, and I wouldn't mind if some enemies took insane amounts of punishment because, hey, Stats. How did that guy tank a face full of double lot buck at point blank range? Eh, he's probably got an 18 con. And in an RPG, there's always the promise of more powerful weapons over the horizon. Not in Fallout 4. The fully customized 50 cal rifle is the most powerful gun in the game, which means there is no possible guarantee of a first shot kill. Again, in an RPG, that's fine. But if this is supposed to be a shooter, my expectations change a bit. If I do the work to sneak up on a guy and line up a headshot, I'd like the game to do its part. Bethesda has overbalanced the guns like they're trying to make a competitive online shooter, but they got it all wrong. An automatic version of a gun always does half the damage of the semi-automatic version. Same caliber, same barrel length. It's just arbitrary bullshit for balance purposes. So obviously, the minigun is an absolute pea shooter. A minigun bullet does a tenth of the damage of a rifle bullet, purely by virtue of firing faster. But is this really balance? Heavy weapons in Fallout have always been extremely powerful, and the balance came from their heavy weight, rare heavy ammo, and a high minimum strength to wield them properly. If I commit to the burden of carrying a minigun with me, I expect it to demolish any enemy I finally use it against. Halfway through using every last bullet of a 250 round drum to kill a standard enemy, my brain says, hold on a second, this is dumb. New to the series is the ability to ride invertebrates and man the door gun. Whoa, this is, this is really happening? This was old hat in 2009, man. Even Modern Warfare 2 realized this was getting old. I also can't get immersed in a game with AI this stupid. Like when you're engaged in a firefight and you're taking rounds and your companion is standing around saying, I don't think we're alone. Or when a bad guy says, I must be hearing things again after hearing a protracted gun battle coming from the other room. Or when Preston Garvey says, one of these days we're going to have to put a stop to the Institute. While we are storming the Institute. And of course, it's a bad PC port. Again. The menu system in a Bethesda RPG hasn't been any good since Oblivion, and even that was a sideways step from Morrowind. No two menus control the same, so sometimes you can use keyboard keys for faster navigations, and some other times you have to use the mouse. Trying to target specific body parts in VATS is a pain, because you have to find a sweet spot for it to actually target the right location. Now, in Fallout 3 and New Vegas, this was an annoyance, but not a huge one, because time was stopped in VATS, so you could keep trying until the game cooperated with your wishes. Well, in Fallout 4, time is only slowed down, so you need to make your picks in VATS a lot faster. It's pretty fucking frustrating when the shitty mouse control lets you down in what is literally a matter of life or death. The controls are also compressed way down in the usual console game style. The left alt key is used for melee and throwing grenades. You press it to melee and hold it for throwing grenades. 
If you have a melee weapon, you press it to do a melee power attack and hold it for throwing grenades. It's a total control pileup, which leads to meleeing the air over and over when trying to throw a grenade, or dropping a bottle cap mine on yourself while trying to bayonet a charging ghoul. The thing that really bothers me about Fallout 4, and Skyrim for that matter, is that the leveling system is so fucking pointless. All the enemies level with you, so the challenge level never changes. You fight your first deathclaw at level 5 and are barely throwing out scratch damage with your best gun. 20 levels and a dozen upgrades later, you're fighting another Deathclaw and still barely doing damage. You may have improved, but the Deathclaw improved just as much, so what was the point? The levels and perks you get don't make you any more powerful, they just slightly change the way you play the game. You think you're getting more powerful since the weapons perks give you damage boosts and such, but that's not true. All those do is keep you competitive, which is why Skyrim becomes an infuriating slog if you accidentally leveled non-combat skills. The higher your level gets, the more restricted you are, because you concentrate on a few skills and that dictates how you fight. In an RPG, most encounters should get easier as you level, and that's what's good about them. If you don't like it, maybe you don't like RPGs. There has to be a point where you start dominating lower level enemies, because if garden variety bandits and raiders level with you, it feels like you never get better. And RPGs are all about getting better. That's why Fallout 4 isn't that exciting to me. Combat against basic wasteland idiots is exactly as easy or difficult when you're level 50 and decked out in an ace custom suit of power armor as it was when you were fresh out of the vault with only a pipe wrench and a blue jumpsuit. I hope Bethesda gets back into the spirit of RPGs again someday. Oh, and by the way, when the entire game is basically about picking up trash off the floor, having every companion NPC constantly make fun of you every time you do isn't funny, it's obnoxious. And that was 2015. Sorry I didn't make more videos, but, you know, life gets in the way sometimes. Hope to see more of you this year. Take it easy.